Mr. President. Mr. Sergeant at Arms. The Governor of the State of Vermont, Peter Shumlin. It is now my distinct honour to present to you the Governor of the State of Vermont, the Honourable Peter E. Shumlin. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Mr. President, Mr. Chief Justice, Mr. Speaker, members of the General Assembly, distinguished guests, my fellow Vermonters. Two years ago, I delivered my first budget address. Times were tough. We faced a financial gap of $176 million, and together we made painful choices. As I begin my second term, the picture has brightened. Since the depths of the recession, our revenues are up 27 percent. We enjoy the lowest unemployment rate this side of the Mississippi, and we're slowly emerging from the Great Recession in better shape than our neighbors. We're also delivering on our promise to rebuild Vermont better than the way Irene found us. We just broke ground on a new state hospital, and we're building the best community-based mental health system in America. Between, between the federal reimbursements, uh, sorry, between insurance, FEMA, and recaptured federal reimbursements, once the new hospital is certified, the $43 million total cost for Brattleboro, Rutland, and Berlin will be paid for in a year and a half without reaching into the pockets of Vermont taxpayers. This is an extraordinary result. <laughs> this is an extraordinary result, and I, and I want to thank you for your collaboration and swift action. Unfortunately, we're once again facing big challenges in our state budget that will require more tough choices and restraint as we confront continued uncertainty about the fiscal crisis in Washington. Today, I present a proposal that balances our state budget without raising broad-based taxes. It invests in areas crucial to our future job success. It keeps our, it keeps our reserves full and our pension contributions funded at the recommended levels. It's a budget that matches Montpelier's appetite for spending with Vermonters' ability to pay. It also redirects existing dollars to grow prosperity, putting vulnerable Vermonters, uh, uh, sorry, protecting vulnerable Vermonters while providing the help they need to get off of welfare and get back to work. My budget also includes targeted investments that will ensure a brighter jobs future and greater prosperity, such as early childhood education, continuing workforce development training, and more funds to enhance our creative economy. To support Vermont's farmers and our, international, and our national leadership in our farm-to-plate, forest products, and value-added agriculture, 
we allocate $1.5 million to our working lands. <laughs> to make higher education affordable to all Vermonters, my budget includes the first increase in five years, an additional $2.5 million for UVM, the state colleges, and VSAC, all directed solely at reducing tuitions for Vermont's students. There are five areas, five areas, where bold transformation and targeted investments are critically needed. In order to keep Vermont on the path to prosperity, first, our education system, including support for our youngest children. Second, our welfare benefits, Third, health care costs. Fourth, our transportation funding. And fifth, our investments in clean energy and efficiency. First, the most important investment we can make to grow jobs and secure prosperity is for our children, is for our children to make sure that our educational initiatives are implemented that I called for in my inaugural address. <clears throat> We, we used to think of high school as the four walls of a traditional building near our village downtowns. But now, with our 21st century technology, with virtual learning, our technical education centers, our internships and, and apprenticeships op opportunities, and our many colleges willing to offer credit to our students while they're in high school, the four walls of our school buildings have been dissolved. We must embrace and harness this change. This requires us to think of our education system not simply as K through 12, but as K through job. Now, now I'm not saying that everyone needs a four-year degree or an advanced degree to make a good living. For some students, uh, for some students, post-secondary job training or a two-year college degree will secure a good paying job in a field that they love. But I am saying that a high school degree alone is no longer good enough to ensure a bright future. We know that 62% of the jobs in a new economy will require post-secondary education, but only 45% of our high school students are continuing their education today. We have to seize the opportunity to reshape our education system to meet the demands of our STEM-hungry workforce. And I believe, I believe that the key to our success is to allow the existing money that we're spending right now to follow each student. We must make this happen this session. Now, Vermonters agree that giving our kids a strong start as early in life as possible is the best thing we can do to ensure their bright future. We have a responsibility to examine how we're using taxpayer money so we provide the strongest possible start for our highest priority, our children. In my inaugural address, I called for the largest increase ever in the state's early childhood support by redirecting $16.7 million from the state's portion of the earned income tax credit to help lower income families pay for the cost of quality childcare. This is not new money. It's money the state is already spending by supplementing the federal in earned income tax credit. There's been a fair amount of discussion about my proposal <laughs> and some misunderstanding. <laughs> Let me tell you why I believe that cha this change makes sense. Here are the facts. This year, Vermont taxpayers paid $26 million to supplement the federal earned income tax credit. 
While 23 other states also make some match in the federal credit, 27 states choose to contribute nothing. Vermont's contribution is the second highest in the nation. Many of you may be surprised, as I was, to learn that because this program is federally indexed, Vermont's contribution has risen 49% in the past eight years, while state spending in other programs per beneficiary has stagnated. Reallocating $16.7 million from our current $26 million credit will bring us in line with other states. And here's the point that may be getting lost. No one is proposing to eliminate the important and critical earned, in earned income tax credit, and we never would. Our proposal would mean that an average eligible recipient with no need for childcare would see a 15% reduction in the combined federal state payment in a program that's seen more than triple that growth in the past eight years. It's also important to remember that the state has adopted that, that, that since the state adopted the Earned Income Tax Credit, Vermont has made a number of other policy choices to help lower income Vermonters pay their bills. Our income tax is now among the most progressive in the country. On average, we ask people who make $35,000 or less to pay a tax of less than two cents on every dollar. As a result of Act 60 and Act 68, our property tax and renter's rebate is now based on income giving the largest benefit to those who earn the least. Our sales tax now exempts clothing and shoes in addition to food and medicine. Despite federal cuts, in the past few years, we've scrambled to keep Vermonters warm in the winter by filling the gap in the heating fuel assistance. All these policies deliver targeted help to low-income Vermonters. We cannot be satisfied with business as usual. We have to invest for the future. With the second highest and with the second richest earned income tax credit in America, we have to ask ourselves, is a once a year check from the state that has increased 49% in the past few years the best way that we can offer low-income Vermonters who are struggling the help they need to stay in the workforce? Secretary Racine and the rest of my team have examined this question, and our answer is no. We have concluded that the biggest barrier to work for many low-income Vermonters is the cost of quality childcare. We believe that we should help chip away the benefits cliff for working Vermonters to make sure that the next generation has the best chance possible. Now, now here is the transformation our plan offers. Our proposal raises the child care subsidy for all eligible families, every single one. Today, families making almost $40,000 a year get a minimal benefit that pays for 10 cents of every child care dollar. Those same families, under our proposal, will have up to 50 cents of every dollar of their child care expenses paid for by the state of Vermont. This will enable lower income children to access quality care that ensures healthy brain development, school readiness, and a bright future, while it enables their parents to work and contribute to their family's economic success without actually losing money by going to work. This is a smart, strategic way to create a better future for our children. Now, the second area that requires bold action builds off of our historic commitment to our children and to child care that I've just proposed. We have an opportunity right now to match this significantly increased investment in, in early child education with a fix to the way we deliver our welfare to work benefits. We face an insidious problem right now 
in our welfare system. It's a problem that hurts both those who desperately want to move from welfare to work and Vermont taxpayers who pay for our welfare programs. It might surprise most Vermonters to learn that Vermont is that, that, that from, it might surprise most Vermonters to learn that Vermont is the only state in the country that extends reach-up benefits without interruption to the entire household for a lifetime. In contrast to Vermont, 46 states limit assistance to five years or fewer, and all of our neighbors have limitations either in the time period or cash benefit of their welfare programs. Extending welfare to work benefits without interruption for a lifetime does nothing to actually encourage people to get a job. What is far more troubling is that we actually penalize Vermonters who want to earn money and get a job because we reduce their childcare and other benefits as they begin to earn money, causing many to stay out of the workforce or quit their new job. Because, they don't, because in fact, they do better on welfare. Meanwhile, we've seen our welfare, wares grow, our welfare roles grow and our state budget strain under the pressure. There is no doubt in my mind that solving the way we deliver welfare work to work benefits will improve our long-term prosperity. Vermont is a caring state. The well-being of our most vulnerable families matters to us deeply. And we know that for some, the road out of poverty will be longer than it is for others. This administration will continue to make sure that the safety net is strong for those who are fighting against the unrelenting undertow of poverty. But it is neither compassionate nor prudent to continue a system in which struggling Vermonters are financially punished for getting off government assistance, finding a job, and providing for their children by going to work. Listen, here's how the system should work, as reflected in my budget. The state will provide benefits for a maximum of five years by providing up to three years of initial benefits to Vermonters who need time to stabilize their lives, receive job training opportunities, and find a job. For those who need more help, the state will provide an additional two years of non-consecutive eligibility. There is no better social program than a good paying job. We will not allow vulnerable Vermonters, such as those who are disabled, to fall through the cracks. But we will ask those who can work to get the training and support they need and get a job. Now, this fix is long overdue. It takes courage to say it, but say it we must. Benefits for Vermonters who are able to work must be temporary, not timeless. It's long past time for Vermont to, re to reform our welfare system from one that discourages work to one that makes prosperity achievable for all Vermont families, including those living in poverty. Let's get that done. The third and greatest obstacle standing in our path to job growth and prosperity is the skyrocketing cost of health care. Currently, we spend 20 cents on every dollar we earn on health care, more than the national average. And those costs are growing at unsustainable rates. As our, if our health care costs grow in this decade, at the same rate, that we saw, same rate that we saw in the last decade, costs will again double by 2020. Two years ago, you joined me in starting down the path to the first universal, sensible, single-payer, publicly financed healthcare system in America, 
that finally takes on these unsustainable job-killing costs. The partnership began with the passage of Act 48 and the Green Mountain Healthcare Board. It continues with the creation of the health insurance exchange as required by federal law. In addition to the plans we're releasing today that describes the benefits and costs of, universal health, of a universal health care system and the options to pay for it, we're also releasing a plan detailing the implementation of next year's federally mandated health care exchange, which, which will require no additional dollars in FY 2014. My budget also makes certain that Vermonters currently in Catamount and VHAP do not suffer federally imposed cost increases by allocating the money needed to buy back the premium increases that would otherwise result from the less generous federal exchange. I also keep my promise to begin to, to begin to fix the so-called cost shift from Medicaid to our business community who struggles to provide their employees with affordable health insurance by including long overdue inflationary increases in Medicaid payments that will help reduce insurance premiums. This step alone will save almost $25 million in insurance premiums every single year. This is hard work, and we have more ahead of us. But with your help, we will create the best health care system in America right here in Vermont. The fourth challenge, fourth challenge that requires bold action is the transportation fund shortfall. This is a good news, bad news story. As we move to more fuel-efficient cars and drive less, we're buying fewer gallons of gasoline. 34 million fewer gallons per year since 2005. As a result, our revenues to maintain our crumbling roads and bridges have dropped and are projected to drop even further in the future. This is not a question of raising new revenue or creating new programs. It's a question of repairing and refilling a leaky bucket. If we fail to repair the leaks, our state transportation fund receipts, which are $36.5 million short just this year, will result in our sending back to Washington more than $40 million of federal highway funds this year alone, creating either a delay or cancellation of critical road and bridge repair projects. Sending money back to Washington is, a not, is not, sending money back to Washington is not a smart way to continue the progress that we're making to improve the conditions of our roads and bridges. I pledge to partner with you, reviewing the good work of the Legislative Study Committee on Transportation Funding to determine the best way to repair this leak this year and on into the future. Let's get that done together. <laughs> meanwhile, meanwhile, we must also continue to make strategic transportation improvements, including the rehabilitation of the Western Corridor Rail Line to bring passenger rail from Bennington to Rutland to Burlington to create jobs and economic development in that, in, on the western side of our state that is so desperately needed. My budget proposes $11 million to build upon last year's investments and accelerate our progress on this critical Western Line project. <laughs> Let me now turn to the fifth and last area where our investments will increase our prosperity and Vermont's quality of life. Our leadership in clean energy in Vermont 
is nothing short of remarkable. We have more green, clean jobs per capita than any other state in the country. Since I became governor two years ago, we have seen the amount of solar energy on our grid double. We are successfully harnessing the sun, the wind, our water, fields, forests, and manure to generate clean, green power. We continue to lead the nation in electric energy efficiency. We're on the right path, but it's not enough. We have done a great job of, cre of creating jobs and saving money by helping Vermonters cut down on their electric usage. We have done a lousy job of keeping our homes and buildings comfortable and affordable in our cold winters and days like today. We heat about 60% of our homes with traditional heating oil, a huge and growing expense for Vermonters and a huge cost to our environment. Meanwhile, we have for several winters now kept needy Vermonters from freezing in their homes by scrambling to pay for funding funding oil as a federal government, for heating oil, as the federal government callously slashes its contribution to our LIHEAP program. We must do better. That's why my budget proposes to join our neighbors in Connecticut and Massachusetts by assessing a 10% surcharge on the retail value of break-open tickets and applying the $17 million raised to comprehensive energy program funding. I propose to allocate the $17 million for these three purposes. First, to keep low-income Vermonters warm in a winter through the state's first ever base budget contribution to LIHEAP at a level of $6 million. Let's, let's recognize the sad fact that Washington is unlikely to fund this crucial program adequately, and let's do something about it so that all Vermonters stay warm in the winter. <clears throat> Second, we must create jobs, save energy, and stop wasting dollars in drafty homes by investing another $6 million per year in thermal efficiency. Now, we have a simple choice. As oil prices continue to rise, we can send our hard-earned Vermont dollars to oil-producing countries that mostly don't like us, or we can buy less oil and help fight climate change by keeping our heat inside our homes and buildings. That's the choice. Third, I propose that we provide $5 million as a stable source of support for the Clean Energy Development Fund to continue our leadership in building renewable energy and efficiency projects across the great state of Vermont. Now, I know that we're going to have plenty to debate this session, and at times, we'll disagree. But I'm optimistic about the outcome. Together, we share a tremendous opportunity and a tremendous responsibility to help our economy and to grow prosperity for all Vermonters. We can reshape our education system to match the needs of our 21st century jobs and we can put our money where our mouths have long been by providing childcare benefits to better nurture and educate our most vulnerable children. We can encourage independence and employment while ensuring, while ensuring that no Vermonter is penalized for having a job. We can create the best, most affordable healthcare system in America. We can rebuild our crumbling roads and bridges and improve our rail corridors. We can keep Vermont at the forefront of the clean energy revolution. And we can all do all of this 
while we build jobs and save money. That's what this budget is about. So I ask you to join me, but I also commit an open door and an open mind. We'll have our differences, but we'll carry out our work in the best Vermont tradition, without malice and with respect for each other, regardless of party label. We will work together for the common good. But we must also take bold action not simply find ways to say no. Vermonters expect nothing less, nor should we. Thank you so much.